Welcome back to To The Point. I'm Eric Mitchell, and we have an amazing guest with us today, and you see him here, too. Hold on, if I do cameras the right way. Look at that. Ah, there's my guest right there. Hey, it's Kevin Schumacher. Kevin, how are you today? I am great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks. It's it's great to have you here. Uh, interesting time in our world. Uh, 2020 kind of hit us with everything, uh, COVID, social justice, uh, and an election. And uh, yes. all of them are bad, and none of them are good. Uh, for those of us who are playing at home, we, we well, know... Actually, I like elections. Which one? I like elections right now. You do? Ah, I, I like and I hate them. I, I've already voted. I'm very proud of that. Uh, good job. I was very safe voting. Uh, no one intimidated me. My envelope had a prepaid stamp on it, and I put it in its security fold. I used this very pen to place my vote. Uh, it felt good. And I think other people need to do that. And I, I think it's this election is great because it's, I think it's brought more of us together through all different creeds and cultures. But before we go down that road, Kevin, because we could go down that, and everybody knows when they watch the show with me, that's a rabbit hole. When we go down, we're going down a rabbit hole. But before we get right. there, I want to let the folks at, no, at home know they know me, but they don't know you. So, Kevin, briefly kind of share who you are and how you got. Don't say how you got here on the show. We already know how you did that. But uh, that's by going to booking at tothepointtv.com. In case you're playing at home, that's how you get booked on our show. But, Kevin, tell us how you got where you're at and what you do so people understand when we start going down this rabbit hole, it makes sense. Sure. Uh Today, I'm a movie producer, I'm sorry, short film producer. But how I got here was I sold an apparel company about four years ago. And when I finished, when I had sale, I decided to take a step back and spend more time with my kids, but also uh, to create something that gave back. Uh, I had the opportunity to not work for a few years. Uh, to earn, I didn't have to earn money for a few years. So I created The Smallest Deed, which is based on a quote from John Burroughs, the smallest deed is greater than the best intention. And that's because I had dreams and big ideas, but didn't always pursue them. And I was determined that if I had an idea, I was going to pursue it. If I had a friend who needed help, I was going to do that and, and take action because I had the luxury to be able to try those things. And so I created a company called The Smallest Deed. Um, you might like this. Uh, one of the first things I did was help a friend of mine who'd been deployed to Iraq. His name was Colonel Brian Hernandez. Uh, one of the most incredible people I've met in my life so far. And he had a huge platoon of troops that he wanted shirts and apparel for. And I just, I did all of that at cost. So I just bought the materials, got them printed and handed all the orders and did that. It was tough. Ironically, two or three weeks worth of work, even though I'd been in the apparel industry, it was very difficult to handle the military specs and everything. Um, and I continued down that path with different things that I thought would make a difference. Uh, um, not going into too much, but I worked in an education company. I worked to create a memory system for elementary kids for uh, multiplication tables. And I tried to create a low sugar soda, just experimenting with a few things, and finally landed. On this, uh, I had the idea of creating sketches that would sketch comedy that made fun of Trump when he was younger. And you, you would like that. But <laughs> as we looked at that idea, we decided that once I did that, it would, we being, um, I brought on a friend of mine, Darian McLeod, to help out with this. He's an actor, producer here in Columbia, South Carolina. And we decided that that had nowhere to go. So we wanted to create a series so that we could relate ideas, our ideas to people about race, about politics, and get people to see something while they're laughing at a comedy. So we tried several things. We had an idea ready to go in March when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And with that, we had to just start over. And so that's how we got to where we are today. So I, I, I love this so much because when we talk about it now, you started your series, the, the, you know, the Smallest Deed, which I think is important in 2020 because 
we're in a place where people could get in some pretty dark places real fast where you feel alone. I know I've suffered through that. A lot of people do. It's really easy. You're kept up in your home. You don't go out. It's hard because you don't know. For the most part, most of us in America have to wear a mask and follow these rules. We don't live around in this oblivious world where we go to our hate mongering rallies and sit there and just be like, hey, we hate America. I'm not going to wear my mask we actually care. So it puts us in a dark spot because we're like, we just want everybody to be safe. We take the 212,000 people who have died uh, from COVID and we put them in our you know, hearts and it's scary because you don't want to get COVID. You're trying to hope a loved one doesn't get it. We've had several members of our family get COVID. Now you have the smallest deed. What was your inspiration in doing that because it's got that vibe of paying it forward which i totally dig it's kind of like that thing when you go to starbucks which we no longer do but when we did go to starbucks you would buy like i always like to buy the person's coffee behind me or we've done that in grocery stores it always feels good when you see somebody kind of especially like a single mom or something my wife always is like you're so nice i'm like i just get where it's at if somebody would have done that to me it would put it's that it's like that dopamine and you're a runner, so you'll get this. And I'm a big time, you know, I love fitness. and I'm a daily Peloton guy. Uh, that dopamine that you get when you're done with a workout, paying it forward to me feels that good. It's like, it's almost better than like closing a really big deal or doing anything great. It's almost like you're walking on it. You're like, I did something good. How do I sleep at night? Really darn well, because I know I helped somebody. So what was your inspiration in creating this? Well, there are two pieces to it. The first is that I'm politically oriented and I thought that there ought to be something out there that was fun and was trying to make a difference, especially where I'm at in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But the other part is uh, one of my children is African-American and with him, we've experienced moments of uh, racial injustice, let's say that way. Uh, When he was in aftercare, uh, he after in kindergarten as an aftercare student he'd never had a problem in first grade when a when a new teacher showed up all of a sudden every week he was in trouble in trouble in trouble and i started bringing complaints about this to the administration of the center and after several months and a couple of really extreme incidents where they he literally picked up my son forcefully and carried him uh through a bus one time um they were the Anyway, the administration refused to do anything about it. They said, maybe this isn't the right place for your son. And we had been there with my older son and all my kids. I have three kids. All had been there. We've been there for years. Um, that, that was a really eye-opening moment of how ingrained some, some of this racial prejudice is sometimes. And so I, I woke up to it. I started paying attention and realized that this is a big deal. And... The hard part is is that growing up the way I grew up in the South, white, I don't realize everything. And I was a business school major, so that's even worse, right? So what I have spent the last decade of my life doing is really trying to understand that perspective, especially through my son's life. It's helped a lot. So in this series that we're creating, it's called Right in the Left Lane. The Swallow Seed is the name of the company. Right in the Left Lane deals with racial injustice and deals with the partisan politics that we have and, and makes it fun and shows a couple of points of view that hopefully people can take home with them and, and make them think a little. I, I love that. I mean, it's I don't love racial injustice, so don't get me wrong. I'm not like, I love racial injustice. No, uh, it's unfortunate. You know, South Carolina, you know, kind of everybody from the movies. I mean, I grew up in Orlando and drove up my God, grandparents lived in Beaufort, South Carolina, so I've spent some time oh, kind yeah. of a little bit of everywhere. Obviously, there's a Marine Corps depot there. Uh, I've heard a lot from my friends who were stationed in South Carolina. I was not. I was stationed in San Diego and Hawaii, so uh, California, we actually understand it's a gigantic melting pot, and we're not weird in Hawaii. Well, we're not original there, and we stick out as, you know, white <laughs> dudes with short hair. You know we're not from there. We're mainland people as it is, so... Like there is no racism there because everybody's there. It's such a, you know, always being around it. But South Carolina, you know, has been in the news a lot. I mean, uh, number one, probably the my least favorite. Well, there's a list of least favorite Republicans. But Lindsey Graham uh, was doing this very, this staged event called the Supreme Court nomination. And I won't go too far into that, but that's an interesting woman. Uh, but 
he said something where he said he missed like missing the good old days of segregation right and the way he said that made you think that they're kind of agree with what you're seeing right in your you know in your backyard and in south carolina shouldn't say that you know south carolina is infamous for the start of the civil war happening you know first shot fired from moultrie to fort sumner <laughs> i'm a history guy yes. can you tell uh, to see. yes yeah I, i've sailed around it i physically have seen it also for those of you who are history buffs like me chief osceola from the osceola indians from out of florida where tennis where the florida state seminoles get their name from seminole indians uh right. was actually imprisoned at fort for moultrie to kind of show you <laughs> if you want to put it all together so social justice in our country is interesting during this election and it's come up a lot uh from the president of the united states gassing peaceful protesters uh so he can walk across the street and put a bible upside down and be around white people and then share out loud in some sort of belief that he has done more for black people than anybody than maybe i love that he adds maybe <laughs> the man who freed the slaves, yeah, he didn't do a lot, uh, maybe Abraham Lincoln. And now you having a son that has to deal with this, it's disgusting to have to deal with this racism and being, and I'm saying this as a you know white dude in his 40s, hearing about this makes my blood boil that there's people who are so close-minded towards this. I mean, growing up, I didn't see a lot of racism. The racism I saw was towards the LGBTQ LGBTQ. See, I say them all, unlike Tiffany Trump, who doesn't know all of them. Uh, you know, sorry, I'm, I'm going to get my jabs in wherever I can. Yes. Always. Oh, we'll get jabs. Hold on. I'll be here all day. Uh, but, you know, that was what we saw growing up, right? It was, you know, AIDS was something that was out there. And then now racism has flirted its ugly head again. Uh, and it's scary because I have kids. I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old. My other two in their 20s. And they see it and they don't like it. Obviously, we live in Portland, Oregon, so it's a little different. Uh, I mean, to us, we don't tolerate racism. We hate it. We believe that black lives do matter, that police do need to be reformed. Folks in our show, trust me, we don't have anybody on here who's like, no, all lives matter. We don't put those guests on my show because I laugh at them. Uh, I do. I told them, yeah, it's like all buildings yeah, mattered yeah. on 9-11. So, I mean, where do we, how do we fix this social justice problem? How do we bring attention? Because everybody, there's one side, those of us who seem to have brains believe that there is a problem, Kevin, that there's always been a problem. To go around with a slogan on a hat that says, make America great again, that would be that sometime in our history, America was great. Well, people who have been oppressed, uh, Native Americans in our country, uh, people have been oppressed for years, uh, women voting, we, we, that was a weird thing, taking, you know, even as the 50s and 60s, uh, people believe women belong in the, in the kitchen. Uh, we, right. we saw it at debates two weeks ago, the way that Mike Pence spoke to Camilla Harris and the moderator. We've seen it even during before this debate coming up for the president, where they are attacking this Latino woman because her parents donated to the Democratic Party and they're saying that she's not qualified. Social justice is done right in front of us. The difference is in 2020, we see it. Now, how do we change that? How do we get more people to see our narrative and not go, all lives matter? So... Living in South Carolina, I get to hear all of the arguments about why we are wrong. Uh, majority of my peers have a different perspective than we do. And when I talk about, the, for example, we're both fans of the West Wing. They just see that as liberal trash. They don't even watch it. So the only way to get there is to give them information in a way they can digest it. And that's totally different, which is why we created right in the left lane the way we did. It's, it's a comedy that deals that has Republicans and Democrats mixed together, and we see some Republican points of view. So that gives them the opportunity to say, yeah, this is funny, I like it. It says some things I don't necessarily agree with, but, and if we can show them a few things that they don't necessarily agree, agree with but it makes them just think a little bit and we've taken one baby step toward a new idea a new perspective and so i i, I really believe that comedy is one of the ways to do that there are other people who have different ideas but this is my my way so so kevin off of that kiddingly i'm i'm saying this so don't take offense because i know your project drops really soon uh 
for this, this is something almost out of like cliff notes for like the left and the right, the kind of see where we're going. Because don't get me wrong, there's people on the left that I think are crazy. They're you know, just as nuts as the alt-right. The alt-left is just as nuts. Trust me, they're all here in Portland. All of them are here on both sides. They have gigantic parties here sure. and yeah, we get world attention because of it. I mean, for, you know, left and, you know, left and right, love the name, by the way. I mean, how do you tell your kids about that, right? That's obviously, you know, having a mixed family is amazing. Yes. I mean, it shouldn't be, I mean, it's weird to say that. I, I just said that for people playing at home so they can go look at your Instagram and, and see that themselves. But I mean, number one, we shouldn't have to, a mixed family. I've always hated that. And I came from a divorced family. So that was like a blended family. I don't think anybody needs to say that. And I know even people brought it up and I've seen some very alt-right people not happy with the Supreme Court nominee because her family's mixed too. And they're like, it's, it's the way they say it that I still think we have a lot of growth doing. So I think what you're doing is great, but we need to get to a place where people don't need to go. And she has a black son. And it's like, right. really, does that matter? Because to me, at the end of the day, it doesn't. It's like, great, she has a family. Um, that's good for her. I'm glad that she has a family. It shouldn't be like, Psst. She has a black son, in case you didn't notice. I'm like, yeah, I can see he's walking right there. I'm cool. I, I, I'm not dumb. <laughs> I, all, eyeballs are working. So, I mean, what do you tell your kids as you're building this? Obviously, they know you're doing this. So how yes. do you tell them and how do they respond? I mean, they look, how old are your kids? I was just stalking you on Instagram. It's the only reason why I asked. Oh, sure. You have a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, and an 18-year-old. Okay. So obviously, they're in the know on what's going on. How do you yeah. explain it to them? You've got this production. Here you are. You're doing this. You're very, you and I obviously see eye to eye on everything. Uh, so how do you explain America, October 2020? Well, loaded question. I know. You have, kids, you have kids. It's different for each child. Um, my 18 year old and I went to a couple of Black Lives Matter protests and, and, and were participating in that. It was actually his idea. Um, Julian, who's my uh, African American child, he and I discussed the program because I told him he's part of the inspiration for it. He's the reason I have taken this journey. Um, a little history there. Uh, while we were looking to adopt, when we were given the opportunity to adopt Julian, it was it was a step for me. It was a leap for me to say yes, I want to mix a mixed racial family that a lot of people will say, oh, it's no big deal. But it's something we had to think about. It's something I had to think about and say, should I do this? And I realized that this my hesitation showed that I wasn't representing or I wasn't the person that I was representing. So I'm not racial. I don't see color. And yet here I was hesitating. So I jumped in with both feet and it's been you know, an amazing experience. And I love my son to death. And then my daughter's 10. Um, she doesn't really understand a lot of this. Mostly she just gets excited because one of the characters is her name, Sophie. Uh, that, that, that's the number. <laughs> I love that. that, that see, they, they all, uh, that's what you got to love about kids. Each one is different. We had that in our house when we voted the other night. Uh, it was it was a weird night. It was almost like Christmas. Like sometimes we put the Christmas story on during Christmas time. We're yeah. wrapping gifts or doing a tree. We put on the West Wing reunion special that's on HBO. Uh, you. You, you've let it all out. I think everybody knows I'm a huge, yeah. it, it's really good. And we watched it and we sat down and I called both my kids down that live in the house. And I was like, hey guys, uh, Logan is my 13 year old, the youngest in the family. And my daughter, Madison, she's 16, uh, she's co-creator of the show, by the way. So, you know, she gets the credit of it. Nice. Uh, she, she came up with it uh, in March. We came up with this uh, in tears to me. No, I wasn't crying, she was crying. Figuring out how we could get good positive news out which that's a whole nother thing. And I'm going to lead with that next before you go. But I, we sat down and we voted together. I, I brought him in. My 13 year old, he just wanted to get back up whatever he was blowing up or doing in his room on his Xbox or gaming. You know, 13 year olds, exactly. they, they, yes. they do 13 year old stuff that we all do when we're 13 year olds. I mean, yes. he'll sit down and watch The Office with me. And then we watch Family Guy together the other day. And it was that weird moment where I decided my maturity level is the same as my 13 year old because I'm cracking up at the jokes on Family yeah, Guy. You're laughing at the same jokes, yes. And, and he's laughing too, but we voted to get like my son, they, they watched. And it was so cool to see this generation where I never saw my parents do that. I didn't go to the polling place with them to share this experience with them. 
is amazing because they've seen this world. They've seen it this year. They see, they hear the frustration. They hear how it polarizes families where people are on one side or the other, where people won't talk to us because the four of us went to a Black Lives Matter protest. My children saw firsthand what racism was when a man drove down the street and called us all dirtbags and, you know, a few other lovely names and then sped off after he flipped us off. Lovely gentleman, by the way. Uh, you know, so they got to see that. But at the same time, my children got to see uh, an amazing thing. An African-American man was walking down with his family. He had his cell phone out. Sorry, I get a little choked up about this because it's powerful. He's walking and he's live on some social streaming. And he's talking to his son, but he's sharing this. He goes, I have to share this with you. He's like, look at all these white people. And they're here holding signs that say Black Lives Matter. That's freaking powerful because he never saw that before. It's troubling because I'm in my 40s. It's troubling yes. because it took till 2020 for this to happen. Now, that's my, that's my goal in life. I serve my country. I love my country. Do I think it's great? Absolutely not. I don't. I'm proud of America because of we're awesome. I'm not proud of the way we treat our own people. We've done it our entire right. lives. And then people are like, no, we don't. It's great. I'm like, no. You know, hundreds of years of treating a culture like crap and injustice and imprisoning and suppressing votes doesn't make you good. I hate to say it. You exactly. deal with it. Like you sit here and you're, it's, I'm so like, I want to support your project so much. I mean, I, we're going to put the, blow this up everywhere because it's so important. People need to understand that they have a voice and that people like you are out there sharing it firsthand experience. And your child should not have to go through that. No child should have to go through that. The form of yeah. bullying from Trump's goons continues on. That's what they are. They're not, they're not people. They're goons. There's no other word for it. Goons. And I know they don't like it. And you can send your complaints to hello at to the point tv.com make sure you leave all of them there the good ones will read out loud if you yes. want just you know if you're racist make sure leave all your proud stuff that you need to put out there you want to call you're a goon if you go after a little boy or a little girl because of the color of their skin or their parents or anything you're a goon like there's nothing else beyond that so obviously we keep mentioning so you have a crowdfunding project is it currently going or is it getting ready to go Getting ready. Getting ready. So tell us a little wait, bit about wait, that so folks can go and what they can do, because I know it's the one thing I will say. 99% of our viewers right. are the most amazing people out there, and they totally support what we're going to do. So awesome. I'm going to put the pressure Thanks. on them. Thanks. So how can Thanks they support you? So right in the left lane is the name of the web series. It's five episodes, and we're doing a crowdfunding project on a platform called Seed and Spark. Okay. So if you go there, you can just look for right in the left lane, click on it, see what we're doing, and make a contribution that fits uh, what it, you know, fits what you can do. It's that simple. I love it. So before you go, I I, I, I got questions for you because I'm enjoying this. I don't I. Thanks. You know, we kind of get a little bit of everybody on this show, and it, every you're another you're, you're like the Richard Herman of my show. Richard, I love Richard. Twenty one years as the CNN legal analyst. And let's just say he's pretty colorful when it comes to this election, and I love him because of it. And clearly, you and I get along on this. Where do we go from here? If you were to sit down with a group full of Gen Zers, we both have Gen yeah. Zs, and, and younger, and you sit down and you explain, yeah, I, I've had to do this, so I'm going to ask it to you. Explaining to my children when I say, make America great again, makes me cringe. It's not the people. It's the belief that our country has been great at any one time. Yeah, we've had wars and we've won, but people died. But at the same yeah. time, the same people we've asked to go fight those wars, people of color, women, even the Japanese were interned. Internment is another word for concentration, just so anybody wants to play the word internment camp. <laughs> we can Americanize it all you want, folks. Internment, look it up. It goes along with concentration. It's the same. We just didn't gas people. That's the only thing that's different. Let's just be clear. We're, we're not like, oh, no, we're, we have a history lesson. Uh, where, how would you explain where we go from here to Gen Z and younger? What is the next generation called? Do we even have a name for our- Yeah, how do you get past Z? I don't know. I mean, we kind of screwed ourselves with that because we went with Gen X automatically baby yeah. boomer to Gen X. And I'm like, we missed all these other Very easy opportunities. Point. We, we could have been good for decades. I mean, we didn't think this through. We're like, we went from 
X to Z. We didn't even get Y. We, like we yeah. said, no, not Gen Y, but baby boomers. Way up in B's. Millennial, we went to M. X. So we went back to M. Are we just, maybe we'll just move around. I don't know who's in charge of it. It's the same guy with the hurricanes. I'm pretty sure. It's like, we're going to name that's it right. Delta. So yeah. no, go back. To, that's the final. That's what I got for you. And we'll, we'll close out after this. But how do you explain where we go from here? Um, well, one of the biggest help will be nationalized health care. If we can ever pull that off. Because <laughs> that levels the plating field on so, so many level uh, so many areas it helps small business it helps workers because right now people are staying at jobs simply because they have health insurance there and they can't switch um, small businesses have trouble getting employees because they can't offer the same health care as large businesses um, they have trouble attracting uh, just all sorts of I mean, small business would be helped and small business is small America which helps everything also your workers. Uh, what I want to stress, though, is that that's not a final piece. We also have to deal with the fact and educate people that racial injustice has been happening and put it black and white so people understand. Uh, realize that the New Deal, which I thought was a great thing, actually segregated black out of it, and it only helped white Americans. That was a revelation of in the past two years. I love it. So we have a program that helps everybody and realize that also the trickle down economics that we started with Reagan, we've proven over 40 years that that doesn't work because the rich are getting richer because they hold on to their money. We need an economic policy that taxes the rich and brings money back down into the middle and lower class because guess what those people spend every penny they get because they don't have extra income they need everything they can to survive and that is what really helps the economy so those are both more monetary but they both help yeah that's uh you, you hit the nail on the head. I'm sitting over here like, amen, brother, putting my fist in the air right with you because it's what we need. Uh, and I'm thinking at the same time, I can hear the counter argument to the rich getting richer. Uh, and we're saying this as of right now, as we record this, there's been no stimulus package, but dang it, we're going to get somebody on that Supreme Court bench because that's, I guess, a priority, not right. uh, making sure our small businesses stay alive and people have food on their table as we go into the holiday season. I think that's uh, something people need to consider. I think that leads into, as we close this out, I think we both agree, make sure you go out and rock that vote on November 3rd. Vote, vote, and vote, because that's the only way you have a voice in this country, and this is how we make change. And folks like Kevin here, Kevin Schumacher, my friend, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been powerful. I didn't mean to get emotional earlier, but just talking about what's going on here, it's heartbreaking. As somebody who served this country and seeing great Americans like you bringing up these bubbling to the surface things that need to be talked about, and people need to be able to realize that this is a conversation we need to have. We need to have these uncomfortable Americana conversations. Not, not everything yeah. is a Rockefeller, you know. It's not like, oh, look, it's great. Look at the little boy. Yeah, it's not that way. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Always humor around here. So, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We'll have to have you back on really soon because this has been okay. great. We're going to have all the information to your crowdfund available. If you're watching on C-Suite uh, TV, and YouTube, make sure you scroll down. You'll see the link there. If you can't see it, find it, please message myself or, or the team on our, any on social media, you can find it. We'll, you'll see us promoting it across all of our social media because you want to go out and I encourage you to support it. Thank you. That's what we do. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us and have yourself a great day. Thank you, Eric. Enjoyed it very much. Let's get to the point.